Thank you, sir. It is so good to see all of you here today. Praise God. I, I, really, I really covered your prayers today. I want you to just agree with me um, for utterance that the heart of God is revealed to us today. And that in each of our lives, God is able to accomplish all that he pleases for each of us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. How I many of you know God's got an agenda for each of us? Yes. Amen. Amen? God has desires concerning us. And uh, the Bible says it pleases him. It is his pleasure to us for us. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. So you, you pull, and I'm going to push. Amen? <clears throat> Praise God. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm really am excited about this, uh, just because it just meant so much to me. It blessed me so much to, 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 uh, to receive it and begin to apply it in my life. Uh, yesterday, and um, and while I'm thinking about it, let's let's just give God praise for our our media people and the sounds people. And, um, because they do a wonderful job, particularly you know the the people that that have to put on your screen, because them and a basic outline of what I have um, but I but but I tend to get more after I present the outline to them so what I tell you is is not necessarily in the order that they have it so they have to find it amen and 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 sometimes it's just uh, you know it, 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 they, they, they do a good job. And so I, I just want you to know that, that um, it's not necessarily, you know, just an a, a, a easy task. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. And, uh, and, and just thank God for all of you in whatever your task and your role is in this ministry. Um, you are very, very much appreciated. And please know that everything you do as unto the Lord, God sees it, and God is faithful to reward it. He is faithful to reward your faithful service. Your service is a seed, and there is no such thing as a seed that you sow that God doesn't respond to. Amen? No such thing as a seed that you sow, because it's a law. You can't sow without reaping. Your service is, is, and your worship is a seed. Amen? And so when we do it as unto the Lord, it has great recompense of reward. Amen? Glory to God. Glory to God. And uh, so we need, to, we need to come up to a place in our, in our relationship with the Lord where, where we walk with him, where we talk with him. Amen? Where we listen to what he says to us and we conform and comply with what he's telling us. Amen? Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. So today, I, I want to use as a, a topic today the repositioning of our hearts for a supernatural life. The repositioning of our hearts for a supernatural life. Amen? When, when, I, when, when I use that, that phrase repositioning, you know, with, particularly when you're talking about the repositioning of the heart, we're talking about what we actually believe in our hearts. Amen? Uh, and more specifically, uh, where we have placed our trust where we have placed our confidence. Uh, 
in what or in whom um, does our faith stand? Amen? Amen? So when we're talking about the repositioning of our hearts, we're talking about uh, more specifically, I guess, uh, in, in, in what have we placed our faith in? And so, and so a lot, and for a lot of us in the body of Christ, uh, the, the majority of us in the body of Christ, um, uh, our, our faith is, is more aligned with, shaped by, if you will, um, whatever degree of faith we are, are, are living by, um, it's not actually genuine Bible faith. It's, it's what I, I, I would call a, a pseudo faith. Are you following me? There's a scripture that talks, it, it has in the scripture unfeigned faith, right? That, and, and it invites us or commands us to, to check our heart to see that we be in faith, right? It talks about an unfeigned faith. I think that, that, that Paul is talking to Timothy about the faith that was in his mother and grandmother. And that term unfeigned. So if something is feigned, if it's unfeigned, then there is the possibility for the feigned, for the false, for the pseudo. And, and, and a pseudo faith is we profess to believe what we see in the Bible, but before we actually will act on it, we, we demand physical evidence to satisfy our senses. And, and, and so that's not real genuine Bible faith. That's, that's, that's really us as Christian people having faith in the wisdom of man as opposed to having faith in the power of God. Are y'all following what I'm saying? It's like Timothy, I mean uh, Thomas, uh, over there in the book of John, when uh, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared, just came in the room where the disciples were, uh, Thomas wasn't there. And, and the disciples, you know, they, they saw him. And then when they told Thomas about it, Thomas said, unless I see, unless I touch, unless I can put my hands, right, in the, in the, in the hole prints, in the side, he, he said, and what was he say? He said, unless I see it, unless I touch it, I will not believe. Now, later, Thomas was present, and Jesus showed up again. Notice, notice where Jesus is showing up. He's showing up at church. He's showing up where the believers are assembled. Thomas was out of place. He, that's why he missed the first time Jesus showed up. Whenever you're not where God wants you to be, you're going to miss out. But, but Jesus showed up another time and Thomas was present. And he says to Thomas, he said, look, behold, here, here, here's, the, here's the hole in my hand. Come in and, 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 and put your finger in the hole, stretch forth and put your hand in my side. Now Thomas seeing, he sees with his eyes, he has the physical evidence, he says, my Lord, my Lord. And basically Jesus said, okay, yeah, you, you believe because you see me. But blessed are those who believe who have not seen. And see, that's, that's pseudo faith. We believe what's in the scripture, but not because it's the scripture, we believe it because we have physical evidence that supports it. And that's the danger of pseudo-faith. Because when the physical evidence is not there to support it, the book still says what it says. But what you going to do with it? See, if, if your faith in it is only as far as you can see that your situation and circumstances line up with it, then it's not real faith at all. If it's a pseudo faith, and the faith is really more in the wisdom of man as opposed to the power of God. And so there must be, if we want to live the supernatural life that God has called us to, there must be a repositioning of our hearts, a repositioning of our faith. We, our faith must actually be in the power of God. Amen? And now, now, now that, that's not, that begins with a, a decision, a quality decision 
to just live in complete surrender to the word of God. Right? Now, it begins with a decision. But that decision must be acted on and walked out with every decision thereafter. With every command you and I receive from the, from the Spirit of God, there, that decision to, be, to live in surrender uh, to the will of God and the Word of God, to the Spirit of God, must be acted on with, with each time we get a prompting and a leading from the Spirit of God. Are you following me? And so the danger is there will be times where we can just see and perceive with our senses uh, conditions and circumstances that line up with what we're believing. And that's, that's okay, but you just, you got, you just got to be mindful that when those conditions and circumstances are not in line with what we're believing, when they're contrary to what we're believing, we must still believe and act on what God is saying to us even in the face of contradictory circumstances and evidence. Yes. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So, so, so in order to live this supernatural life, to, to live a life supernaturally sustained by God, we must have faith in the power of God. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So wherever my faith is, to whatever end I've placed it in something other than God's word, I got to change that. Amen. To, to, to what end I have given something other than God's word place in my heart, I've got to change that. Amen. Are you following what I'm saying? That's why we're commanded above all that we do to be in, in our diligence. We are to be diligent in the guarding and the keeping of our heart. Yeah. Why? Because out of it flow the issues of life, the forces of life, the boundaries of life. Whatever boundaries we live within come from what we believe in our heart. Whatever the, the, the boundaries that contain our, our life, those boundaries are a, are a byproduct of what we have allowed to influence what we believe in our heart. And so when the boundaries, when, 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 so, so, so God is, Ah, glory to God. So God is constantly, constantly, especially now in this present day, in this hour, in this season, if you will, God is, God is looking to move us beyond the, 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 the present boundaries of our lives. He's looking to stretch our faith beyond the point that we are accustomed to applying it so that he can bring our lives beyond the boundary that we have been contained by. And out of the current boundary, I got to apply my, I got to let God take my faith beyond where the, the, the conditions of my circumstances. Are oh, you understand what I'm saying? So he's constantly, particularly in this hour, in this season, he is looking to move us beyond the current boundaries of our lives beyond the current present conditions of our lives to a more favorable condition however to move from current condition to a more favorable condition is going to require trusting God beyond what we're what we're accustomed to trusting it's going to require obeying God and demonstrating faithfulness on a level higher than what we're accustomed to demonstrating are y'all following what I'm saying so therefore, it is of the utmost importance that we're diligent in the guarding and keeping of our heart because we don't want to allow it some stuff to get up in there that could possibly affect our trust in God. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to allow the, 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 the word we believe in our heart to become contaminated by, by, by stuff that's contrary to the word. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Even to the, even to the conversations that, that, that you partake of. Every conversation is, is not of God. Even to the jokes, the, 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 the humor, the, 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 the songs, the, the media, the movies, the TV shows. It's entertaining and we, and we get caught up in it in our soulish area. But, but in that 45 minutes, hour, hour and a half, two hours, our hearts are wide open and susceptible 
to whatever lies the enemy want to spin. Now, we can hear a lie on TV and know it's a lie. We can know it's not true. We can know it's not the will of God. We can know it's entertainment, and it's just acting. But words are being spoken, and spirits are being released. And the attention and consideration you give to it, you're opening your heart up to the entities that can contaminate what you believe in your heart from the word of God. You got to ask yourself, okay, is it really worth my future to find out what happened with, with, with so-and-so? It's just a story. It's just, it's, just, it's just a story. It's just entertainment. Are you following what I'm saying? Y'all all right? So... So here's my first statement I want to give you. Uh, God can still get you there. God can still get you there. Where, where, where is there? There refers to the reality of everything God has predestined for you. The reality of the dreams that he has put in your heart. The reality of those goals and aspirations. The reality of, 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 of all that you were created to do and be. God can still get you there. The, 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 there is, refers to the reality of fulfilling your purpose. God can still get you there. In spite of our failures, in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our selfishness and self-centeredness, in spite of our sin, in spite of us putting self ahead of God, not that we want to continue doing that, but in spite of the fact that we have done that, God can still get us there. Amen. In other words, when, when, when we turn left, when we should have turned right, we, we cost ourselves the future God intended. We cost ourselves the good he intended. We cost ourselves the best that he intended, and that's why he told us to go right, to get the best. But we went left because of the gratification of the flesh, because it was more reasonable, because it seemed less dangerous. It fit with our reasoning, and we chose left instead of right. We chose wrong instead of what God said. And in that, we, we cost ourselves the good God intended. We, we, instead of progressing in the plan and purposes of God, we, we digressed. Instead of moving forward, we didn't stay still. We didn't stay standing and maintain. We went backwards. There is no such thing as maintaining status quo. You're even moving forward or you're moving backwards. But in spite of having cost ourselves the future God intended, he can still get us there. He can still get us there. He can still get us there. Why? Because the there that he intended, he, he hadn't changed his mind about it. His will has not changed about it. It's still his will. It's still the original intent that he ordained for us. It is eternal. It's still available. We just have to change or reposition in our hearts. We have to reposition our hearts, what we've placed our trust and faith in. We've got to remove it from the wisdom of this world and we've got to place it where it belongs in the power of God. 
That's repentance. That's us acknowledging, God, I've been wrong. God, I missed it. That's, that's my bad, Lord. I sinned. And upon our confession, he's faithful. He's just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of our unrighteousness. In other words, in other words, whatever we messed up in the fellowship and whatever was messed up to, call, to keep us from progressing is resolved. The fellowship is intact and we're now in a state where we can progress and move forward. You follow me? Y'all follow what I'm saying? Whatever your aspirations, whatever your desires, that thing you know God birthed within you and instructed you about and, and corrected you on and told you what to do, he can still get you there. And the good news is, the good news is, see the reason it seems, now, now, now if I were to ask you, don't do it, but if I were to ask you to raise your hand, if you can name or, point or, or identify at least one time in your life, it's just one time in your life, don't raise your hand, but if you can identify at least one time in your life where you, you knew it was God, but for uh, any number of reasons, you convinced yourself not to obey. And afterwards you regret it, like, man, I knew it was God. I knew I should have done that, or I knew I shouldn't have done that. Right? And the consequences of that disobedience set us back, cost us uh, something. You, you follow what I'm saying? But and sometimes when you look at that thing from a human natural standpoint, we begin to call, cost of what it's going to take to get back on course, to get back on track, and to get to where we should have been. And, and, too, and so often... The cost exceeds our ability. It exceeds what we believe we're capable of. It seems so overwhelming that it seems hopeless to try. But see, here's the good news. In God getting us there, it, 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 it won't require any of our ability all it requires from us is a yes to God a repentant heart a repositioned heart so it's going to cost us the comfort of our flesh but to move from where we are to where God wants it to be to, for him to get us back there it'll be by supernatural means it'll be by supernatural means by the supernatural power of God. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Amen. You want an example of it in scripture? You remember when Jesus got through preaching? The Bible says he was dismissing folk and sent the disciples on across the sea. And then afterwards he went up into the mountain to pray. The disciples was, was, was rowing across the sea and they encountered a storm. And they was rowing and rowing and rowing and it was fierce and fierce and fierce and they wasn't getting nowhere because the winds were contrary. Now, the Bible says Jesus came down out of the mountain walking on the water. And, and when they saw him, they were afraid. And somebody said, it's a spirit, it's a spirit, it's a spook. Jesus said, be not afraid, it's me. It's me. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, if it's really you, bid me come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. Peter gets down out the boat and walks on the water. 
When he took his eyes off Jesus and got distracted by the present evil conditions, the circumstances, the wind, the rain, the waves, he was moved with fear and he began to sink. But the Bible says he cried out, Lord, save me. And the Bible says Jesus reached forth his hand. Now, if Jesus could save him by reaching forth his hand, obviously Peter had been making some progress walking on that water. See, that's what the enemy does. He tries to make, when, when, you, when, you're, when you're right there, he tries to make the conditions seem their worse, to make you lose heart and faint, cave in and give up and sink. But Jesus stretched off his hand and saved him. Now remember, they still out at sea in the middle of a storm. They've been working trying to get from one side to the other for who knows how long. And they, they're not making any headway because of the contradictory winds. Got it? The Bible says when Jesus got in the boat, immediately they were on the other side. Did you get that? What they were trying to do for who knows how long in self, in their own wisdom, in their own ability, but couldn't do because of the opposition once Jesus was on board. See, once you let Jesus on board, once you let him run the thing, supernatural power kicks in. Thank you, Lord. And immediately... See, it's time for some immediateness. It's time for some and suddenlies. And I prophesy in the name of Jesus that we're in a season of immediateness and suddenlies. As you can, as you continue, as as you continue to give your time and consideration to the word in daily fellowship, continually giving voice to the word, speaking it as a present truth. The force of faith is continually working to rearrange conditions and circumstances to be favorable, and the work is going on that the, the senses cannot perceive, but it will be seen in a way that will seem and suddenly and immediately, and you're going to be right there. You're going to be right there. The Lord can get us there. He can catch us up. He can catch us up. If you're dealing with past due bills, he can get your bills caught up. Current. Ahead. Notes, debts, mortgages, paid off, canceled out, and no more. Overtaken with blessings. This is the word of God. This is the will of God. And many of us, we've seen and experienced this on a level and to a measure that our present placement of faith and trust has allowed. But to see and receive more, there must be more of us that we give to God. Y'all follow what I'm saying? God, God let, let, okay, women, married women, raise your hand, please. All right. Any woman that want to be married, raise your hand with the married women. Any woman that's ever been married, raise your hand with those currently married. Now you tell me, you can put your hands down, put your hands down, put your hands down. How many of you, you might want to be married very badly, you might already be married and, and, and happily married, but, but, but now how many of you are willing to be married only part-time. You just want a part-time husband. You want to share your husband. Men, married men, you want a part-time wife. You don't want no part-time girl, you don't know. You want a full time. The Bible says that Jesus 
is the bridegroom. The church, his body, is the bride. Jesus don't want no part-time bride. He don't want to share us with the world. He don't want to compete against the world for our hearts. But if we'll willingly, intentionally give Jesus our heart, our whole heart, our whole being, if we'll trust him with self, with everything dear to us, with everyone dear to us and precious to us, he'll be faithful to keep it and do right by us. He'll do right for us. And whatever he asks you to give up, to let go of and turn away from, is him looking out for you because he sees the bad that it's going to cost you. And he has so much better to give you. Are y'all following what I'm saying? God can still get us there. Amen? Amen. And he wants to do it supernaturally. Go to, go to first, pull up for me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. No, 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 no. No, I'm sorry. Let, let's look at this first. We'll go to 1 Corinthians. Let me have, and for the sake of time, let me just get, let me, let me get into King James. Let me get Psalm 139, beginning at verse 16. God can still get you there, right? So, so, so the, now everything that there consists of for you has already been written in a book. Amen. To him which led his people through the wilderness for his, I'm sorry, Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. To, and, and so, now listen. Thine eyes did see my substance. Yet being unperfect. This is talking about God. God, you saw me while I was yet unperfect. And in thy book, all my members, the, the summation of my life was written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Verse 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. How precious are thy thoughts unto me. God has you on his mind. God, God, God is well aware of everything you're dealing with. He's well aware of who's tripping in your life. Your children, your husband, your wife, the person on the job. He's, he's well aware of the opposition of the contrariness, the tail bearing, the backbiting, the pressures, the, the he know, and now, now, and yet he has thoughts concerning us. Yeah. Right? The psalmist says these thoughts are precious. In other words, what God thinks about you matters. What God thinks about you is precious, is priceless. Right? Yeah. What God has has fashioned and set aside and appointed for you is precious and priceless. His real and plans and purposes are for you are, are precious and priceless. And they were written in a book. Let me get verse 18. And if I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. See, you got to understand, every, th every thought God has about you is, 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 is is, is for your good. Yeah. Every thought is a good intention he has for you. Every thought is a promise he's made to you. Mm. Are you understand what I'm saying? Now, let, now, go back to verse 16, and let me just have it in the Passion Translation, beginning at verse 16. Now, now, because see, 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 the there, we're going to see what the there consists of. Everything there consists of has already been written in a book concerning you. It's already been recorded. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Glory to God. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Verse 17. Every single moment you are thinking of me. 
How precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires towards me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I wake each morning, you are still with me. You don't abandon me. You don't leave me. You don't forsake me. You don't turn your back on me. You're right here with me. Give me verse 18. Oh God, come. No, 18, excuse me. Did I read 18 already? Give me, give me 18, please. Oh, it ain't no 18. Huh? Oh, it, it, was, it was joined together? Did I already read it? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, okay, my bad. Here's the bottom line. God got you. He knows everything he planned and purposed for you. Everything he set aside for you. That's your there. And he can still get you to that reality to the degree you're willing to reposition your heart. Amen. Amen. Now go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All right, so, so let me, let, let's put it in the Amplified Classic just, you know, for the sake of time. Thank you. All right, so now look, as for myself, brother, now this is Paul writing to the church of Corinth. As for myself, brother, when I came to you, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony and the evidence of mystery and secret of God concerning what he has done through Christ for the salvation, for the salvation of men. I didn't come with none of that. I didn't come with lofty words of eloquence or human philosophy and wisdom. I didn't come with any of that. Now, now why is Paul making this clear? You got to understand, how many of you remember, how many of you remember from the word that, that Paul went before he became Paul, he lived and walked as Saul. He was, he was educated by, at that time, the leading scholar of the day. Man named Gamel or Gamel. He, he, was, he, was a, he was taught by Gamel. Right? So now, now Paul was highly, highly, highly educated. Highly educated, right? Uh, later, he, he makes mention of it over in the book of Phil, uh, the, uh, Philippine, Philippians. He makes mention of the fact that if there was such a thing as somebody having natural things going for him to boast about, it would be me. Now, I'm paraphrasing it. He said, but rather than boasting all those natural things, I count all that as dumb in comparison to knowing Jesus. Are you following what I'm saying? Glory to God. Glory to God. Man, if you know Jesus. All I want is Jesus. <laughs> what, what? You don't need nothing else. If you know who you got in Jesus. If you know what you got in Jesus. Mm. So Paul is saying, I came to you educated, well-versed, trained, all that in a bag of chips, but I'm not counting or depending on any of that. Verse 2. He says, for I resolved to know nothing, to be acquainted with nothing, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing and to be conscious of nothing among you except Jesus Christ the Messiah and him crucified. He said, I came to you, but I came having made up my mind. I didn't want to be known for anything but Jesus. Now, on the, now in addition to that, what, what, what go to verse 3 for me. He said, and I was in I was in, passed into a state of weakness and fear, dread, and great trembling. 
after I had come among you. There are some, there, there, there are some instructions God will give you in an attempt to move you from your present conditions and circumstances to a greater, more favorable state of conditions and circumstances that's going to require you to be willing to trust him with more than you're accustomed to trusting him with and to, and to depend on him far beyond what you're accustomed to depending on him. It's going, he will instruct you in a course of action that you will have to trust him to take the course. You will have to surrender everything to him and depend on him to be God and do what he said. If you want to go there. Yes. Now, in the face of those contradictory circumstances, there may be a moment or two of fear, dread, and trembling. But see, that's not fear having in it your heart. That's just the, the fear that thinking about everything against you can invoke. But once you become aware and identify the present fear, it's simply a matter of what you're choosing to think on. Stop thinking about the problem. Stop thinking about everything contrary to you and, and the plan of God. Start thinking about the promise and his commitment and faithfulness to you, how he showed up for you and kept his word to you in the past, how he's always come. Start rehearsing past victories and triumphs and giving him praise for what he's done in the past. And if you got to obey him in fear of trembling, then just go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. See, you can't wait till the conditions are optimum, optimum conditions. You can't wait. Uh, if you're waiting for the, for, the, for the weather conditions to be right, for the wind and the clouds, you'll never sow, you'll never act, you'll never obey. If you're waiting for everything to line up where you can see that it'll work, you will never obey God. Because Satan will see to it that the conditions and circumstances are always contrary. And see, when we're walking by how it looks, we're going to stay bound, we're going to stay contained. But when we walk by faith and not how it looks, when we walk by what God says about it, what he's revealing to us, how he's leading us by his spirit, then you break out of that current place that current condition into the one God has for you. What do you do? What, what, what am I have? You, you go from where you are to there. Yes. That's how God gets you there. Amen. Are you following? Amen. All right, let me have next verse. He says, and my language and my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, and plausible words of wisdom. But they were in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power, a proof by the Spirit and power of God, operating on me and stirring in the minds of my hearers, 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 the most holy emotions and thus persuading them. So, so, so notice what he's saying. He said, listen, though I've been trained, well-educated, well-versed, and, and got all these degrees, I didn't come amongst you to tell you about all that. I didn't come to you depending and trusting in all of that. I came not wanting to be known of nothing but Jesus Christ crucified. And even in the face of, 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 of uncertainty, even with fear and trembling, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. He said, now my speech and my preaching private life and my public ministry were not with enticing words to please itching ears, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Ghost. Why? Wow. Wow. Give me verse 5. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, mere human philosophy, but in the power of God but in the power of God, but in the power of God. Somebody move your arm, move your shoulders and find that that pain is gone. Glory to God. That's the power of God. That's where our faith needs to be. Just receive that pain. Go in the name of Jesus. Are you following what I'm saying? Yeah. How many 
if you've ever experienced, maybe in a setting or maybe just now, you know, pain, go in Jesus. When that command is given in Jesus' name, you experience the pain leaving your body. Raise your hand if you've experienced that. All right, put your hands in. Now, do, you know why, do, do you know why the pain left? The pain left because of the invocation of a greater name. The name of Jesus. At that name, every knee bows, every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. Pain is a name. Cancer is a name. Tuberculosis is a name. Arthritis, they're all names. Every name carries a degree of authority. When you name it, you give it authority. You're acknowledging the presence of it, and you're giving it a degree of authority. That's why they ought not be naming all these tropical storms, because they give it authority. But the book said he raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Father of all principality, the power, the dominion of might, above every name in this world and in the world to come. Above every authority that has an existence, you have the greater authority through the faith in the name of Jesus. Now, in the same way, pain a spirit of infirmity must bow its knee at the name of Jesus, so must the spirit of poverty bow its knee at the name of Jesus. If pain will go at a command given by Jesus' name, money will come at a command given by Jesus' name. Money cometh in Jesus' name. Now, same name, same command, same authority. Both are subject to the name. Both are subject to the name. You, matter of fact, if you got your wallet, you got your pocketbook nearby, you need to grab it right now. Just grab it right now. Grab that thing right now and repeat it after me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus... I take authority over lack in my life. I'm breaking the spirit of poverty off my life. I command an uprooting right now of all the poverty seeds that's been sown in my life. I'm speaking now to my basket and to my store. And in the name of Jesus, money coming to me now. In Jesus' name. Now point and say, I command you to build up in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Now you might think this is foolish. You might, you might feel a little foolish doing it. But God chose the foolish things to confound the wise. Are you following what I'm saying? He chose the base things to bring to naught the things that were so that they become naught. Are you following what I'm saying? God can still get you there. God can still get you there. But it's going to require what? A what? What's it going to require? A what? A repositioning of the heart. Of our faith. It must be in the power of God as opposed to the wisdom of men. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, now, now. Go... Uh, I got another statement. Uh, in order to live supernaturally, we must, say must. must, this is not optional, we must cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit and learn to follow him follow him to follow him to follow him that that word follow that means that means live in obedience to him that means accompany him in the direction he has chosen for you to walk and is leading you into 
That means serve him. That means worship him with your everyday decisions and choices. With your everyday getting up, walking around, going to bed life, we ought to be following him, the Holy Spirit. But I got to cultivate a relationship with him through daily communion with him. Daily communion and fellowship with the Holy Spirit, I cultivate that relationship with him. I know I asked you to go, well, I didn't yet, but look, I didn't give you this one. But pull, pull up for me, if you can, John, John, John 17, verses 3 and 4, starting in verse 3, John 17 and 3. I got to cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Listen, listen, listen. Uh, Abraham was known as a friend of God. Right? Jesus said this, from henceforth I call you no more servants. No longer am I going to call you servants, but I'm going to call you friends. Yes. For you are my friends if you obey me and do what I tell you. Yes. Right? So right here it says, and this is life eternal, or this is, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. In other words, in other words, everything that eternal life consists of, in order for it to be a tangible reality in our life, it's going to come to the degree that I know him, that I'm intimate with him, that we have daily communion, that I live daily in his presence in fellowship with him. Verse 4, please. Jesus said this, I've glorified thee on the earth, talking about to the Father. And I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Yes. Every one of us have a work. Yes. Every one of us have a purpose, a kingdom for being in the earth, a work to do and fulfill. Yes. And, and, oh, and, 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 and God wants us to progress in the work. Yes. He wants us to prosper and succeed in the work. Yes. And in order to do that, I, I must know him because to, to, to prosper and succeed at it, I got to obey him. And to obey him, I got to know him because if I don't know him, I won't trust him. And, and listen, listen, I can know him on the present level that I know him, but God ain't, he ain't content to let me remain there. He's going to stretch my faith and tell me to take an action that's beyond what I'm used to taking, beyond what I'm accustomed to trusting him with. And in that moment, I got to make a decision. Am I going to trust you beyond what I currently do? Yes. Now, the thing that's going to determine whether you give God that yes or you hold back is, is how much you trust him, how well you know him. You follow what I'm saying? You see, it's some people, the fellowship and the relationship I have with them, I know with what I can trust them with, I know how far I can trust them because they show me through, that, through the fellowship. So I ain't going to try to trust you beyond what you demonstrated I can trust you with. And let me get, get this. I'm not going to entrust to you. Beyond what you have proven, you can be faithful with. And that's the way God is with us. The reason he's trying to take us beyond where we currently are is so he can give us more than we currently have. But he needs another level of trust and faith. There's another level, a greater level of faith that's required to take a step beyond what we're accustomed to. In other words, you might be accustomed to taking the step of giving $100. Praise God, you get the reward that $100 can produce. A $100 seed can produce many more. But now God want to give you more, so he requires more seed. If you got a garden and you done sold an acre, and you done got an acre plot of land, and that you're going to get what the acre plot can yield. But if you want more than what the acre plot can yield, you got to sow additional seed. So God is constantly trying to take us farther than where we are because he's constantly trying to get to us more than what we have. 
It's the law of seed time and harvest that perpetuates it and controls it and governs it. Are you following me? So I got to know him. I got to cultivate a relationship with him. Why? So that in that, in that relationship, trust is developed and I learn how to follow him. Yeah. Now give me Romans 8, please. Romans, Romans chapter 8, give me verse uh, 14. Uh, in the ampl- I mean, in the King James first. Romans 8, 14 in the King James. Thank you, man. So for as many as are led, by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now let's have it in the AMP, the AMP only. For all who are allowing themselves to be led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. See, see the Holy Spirit would do the leading, but he's not going to get behind us and force us to follow. He's going to lead. But we got to allow ourselves to be led. Yeah. How, how do we allow ourselves to be led? By the proper posturing of our hearts. Yeah. You can't have a haughty, prideful, arrogant heart and expect to hear God. God will be talking, but we won't hear him because the, the, the haughtiness and the arrogancy and the pride of the heart makes it, makes it, makes it hard to hear. He'll talk, but we just won't hear. But, but, but when, when we approach God, when we humble ourselves under his mighty hand by casting all of our cares over on him, see, now you're approaching him with a tender heart. When you approach him with a Lord, whatever it takes, whatever you want, whatever it is you require of me, whatever it is you need from me, I'm saying yes to you. When you're willing to take up your cross and crucify your flesh on that cross in order to follow him wholly. See, that's a tender heart. That's a soft heart, a heart that's tender before God. You follow what I'm saying? See, we, so the posturing of our heart allows, it positions us to hear. Uh, before we go to one other translation, there is a verse in John 7. You don't have to turn there. John 7 around verse 15, I think, somewhere around in there. It, this, Jesus says this. Any man that will do the will of God will know of the doctrine that I speak, whether it be of myself or whether it be of God. Any man that will do the will will know whether I'm saying be of God or not. If your heart's desire and decision, if your will is to live according to God's will, then you will know the impressions you get, whether they're of God or not you get you'll know whether they're God or not why by your willingness to do the will of God so the posturing of your heart has to do with your willingness to do his will so with the posturing of our hearts we allow ourselves to be led we put ourselves in a position to be led and to hear and then we choose to follow him now now let me have verse 14 in the passion translation the mature children of God are those moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're reading that in your phone, there's a note there, a little bubble, and if you click on it, it'll say something like, the mature children of God and only the mature, right, are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we're all children of God, but we've not yet all grown to walk as sons of God. See, so maturity, growing up in the things of God matters. We can't stay babes all the time. Some of us still drink, sipping on Similac, and God got some steak and potatoes for us. He said, desire the sincere milk of the word that you grow stronger thereby. You start off with the milk of the word, but you got to get to the point where you're getting some meats and potatoes. Well, what's in the way of that? Getting offended when correction comes, when it don't go your way. That hardens the heart. You follow what I'm saying? The Bible says, the of the Lord is delight with I remember my dad, my dad, the, the Bible says he chases the son in whom he, he love and delight, right? My daddy loved me because he chasing me. He chasing me. 
You, you follow what I'm saying? Now, I remember often, while it was happening, oh, you talking about somebody mad, upset, lip poked out, mumbling after I was way out of earshot. That's one of the reasons I don't have a garden today. Because I was always in my daddy's garden. I said, when I get grown and I can make this decision, I ain't have no garden. My daddy at the time, I thought he was hard on me. And he was. Uh, in comparison to my friends or, you know, people I knew and hung out with, But I thank God today for his chastisement then. As I grew up into young adulthood and became a man and started working a public job, I have never had a boss, a supervisor, a superintendent that demanded more of me than my father did. Everything that's ever been asked of me or demanded of me on a job was a breeze. Now I'm not. Now it was. A, it, it, there were things that that were entailed and, and, and complicated and, and and a lot to it. But my father had created a mindset. You follow what I'm saying? For him, it won't enough. He said, "Cut the grass." Okay, I cut the grass. He come back. Now he hot. Because I didn't cut it the way he wanted it. He didn't say how to cut it. He said cut it. So I'm thinking, well, again, out of earshot. That's your fault. You didn't tell me how you wanted it because you just said cut it. You follow what I'm saying? In other words, what my father instilled in me was not, it, not just anything is okay. You got to do your best. You got you to do it in excellence. Amen. And if you will do it, and, and that's the attitude we ought to have in our walk with God, do it as unto the Lord. Amen. So we give him our best and, and, and we do it in excellence. Amen. And see, a lot of times where it come to church, where it's volunteer and no paycheck and nobody watching over us and seeing if we punch the clock on time, the, the service dwindles after all that's just church no that's church that's kingdom and God gave us his best and he certainly deserves our best all he need from us is a willingness of heart you position the heart to become willing and put your trust and faith in his power his faithfulness to use his power his power will kick in. His supernatural ability will kick in and, and, and carry you. But we got to learn to follow the Holy Spirit. You got to learn to recognize and discern his voice. The Bible, well, I don't, I don't like saying it that way. But I ain't figured out a better way to say it yet. So I'm going to stick with that for right now. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice. They follow me. We're all, so, so that says it. We do hear. He said we know. So I got to say I know. I got to approach the Lord with that in my heart and on my lips. Father, you said in your word, I hear and I know your voice. And I'm going to follow you, Lord. Whatever it is you want, you get, you get it across to me. You make it plain to me and I'll follow. You follow what I'm saying? So, so that's, that, that trust is developed as you cultivate that friendship with the Lord, through that fellowship with the Lord. And in, in the flows of that fellowship with the Lord, 
The Lord will speak to you in that and direct you in what to read, what to do, what to sing to him, what to do. It's something he wants to say. And as you begin to perceive and discern the promptings of the Spirit of God, why it's just you and him in fellowship and communion, that's the same voice that's going to direct you what to do on your job that'll make it easier. That's the same voice that'll tell you where to sow to get you the harvest. That's the same voice that'll speak to you the wisdom of God you need to solve the problem can't nobody else solve. That's the same voice. I got to learn to follow him. And I might with all my heart believe, oh yeah, that's God. Boom, and I start walking. I start walking it out. And as I'm going in the direction I believe he said go, bam, in the middle I say, oh no, that won't God. But then what? guess what? Bam, whatever the leading is, I go with it. So what that won't God? When I started down that road, I believed it was God, and God's going to honor me because I honored him. And he won't let me get too far without any correction. So, bam, when the course adjustment comes, just adjust with the Spirit of God and go with the flow of his Spirit. Go with that peace. See, I've learned this in, in walking with God and following the Holy Spirit. It's sort of like doing a geometry problem. Anybody had geometry in math in school? The thing I remember about geometry, bunch of signs and formulas. You get one sign wrong, and the whole thing is off. But the teacher, a lot of my teachers, they were interested in knowing you knew how to do it. Not if you made a careless mistake and got the sign wrong. So this is what they would say. If you got the sign wrong, but work the problem correctly with the way you thought it was. I'm going to give you credit for the right answer because you worked it right. God will give you credit for the honor you show him in attempting to follow what you believe is him. He's going to honor you for the honor you show him. And he'll, be, he'll get involved to make corrections and adjust us along the way to get us right over here where we need to be. But see, you, you, but, but, but what he can't correct is no action on our part. Well, I don't know if that was Lord or not. Uh, so I don't do nothing. He can't, what are he going to do with that? See, you can't steer a parked car. That car got to get shifted and drive. You got to start taking off before you can steer it. Amen. You got to take the step you believe he's saying take. And as you take it, if it's right, you'll get the witness and keep moving. If it's in error, he'll correct you, then take that one. But know that he loves you enough that he's going to keep you from error, from, from foolishness, from presumption. He will make it plain. But you got to trust him. Again. And what do you you learn from that. Oh, last time I kind of had this thing. I thought that was God turned out it was. And learn to better perceive and recognize that witness. You learn to better perceive and recognize that witness. And see, there are times where, you know, as you, as you spend to start your day and go into the workforce you praying and, and you trying to fellowship with God and somebody you know a thought into your mind and you be like no get out of here I'm spending time with God sometimes that's God bringing somebody to your mind somebody that maybe you're going to see that day somebody that's on your in, in your workplace and if you'll stop and just just follow that flow a little bit you'll find out yeah that's God and he'll have you praying and interceding or he'll give you a word to you can text them, you can call them, or you can tell them when you see them. And the more faithful you are to steward that and act on that, he'll give you more and more and more as time goes on. And before you know it, you might sit there and write out three or four pages and then hand it to him when you see him. Now, on the other hand, on the other hand, you might see him and boom, all of a sudden, there's just this unction. Uh, God, you know God wants to speak. You know God wants to express his love. You don't know what but you sense that unction, that inward flow. And you just yield to it. And you go with the first word that he gives you. You go with the first word that he gives you. Now, it's amazing how God is doing it. Because right now, 
That's what's happening with you. I laid eyes on you three or four different times, and I know God want to speak to you, but I don't know what he want to tell you. But I'm going to yield, and I'm going to go with the flow, and we're going to see what happened. Amen? Will you stand? Will you stand? Come on, come on please. Y'all better give God some praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, just worship him just a little bit. Just worship him just a little bit. Somebody dealing with sciatic nerve issues or what have you, that pain is leaving, health is restored in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Just lift your hands just a little bit. God is deserving. God is worthy. Tonight, tonight, can, can I pray with you? Can I pray with you? Come on, just worship him just a little bit. 
Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Is your mama here? Is your mama here? Where is she? She up there? Okay. Come on, just worship. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What I hear, brighter days ahead. Brighter days ahead. Brighter days ahead. 